I'm a very strong believer in the value of continuous integration. I've been using continuous integration in some form for a very long time. I believe that feature branching doesn't fit into a continuous integration based approach though. I've talked about this before, but this time let's look at it from a slightly more technical perspective. What does integration really mean and how do we manage it when working as part of a team? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. I'd like to thank everybody for watching. We're rapidly approaching 1.5 million views and 50,000 subscribers. I get a lot of pleasure from making these videos and I particularly enjoy reading the comments section and learning from other people's experience and ideas. So if you haven't already, please do hit subscribe and join us uh, and like if you enjoy the video and do add your comments. Let's keep the conversation going. I'd like to also add my thanks to our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus and Specflow. They're all helping us grow this channel and so please do support them by checking out their links in the description below. If you'd like to learn more about continuous integration, branching and deployment pipelines, check out my online training course, Anatomy of a Deployment Pipeline. My views on continuous integration and feature branching are probably the most contentious things that I tend to talk about. There are many things that I talk about that are only my opinion, but I don't think that this is really one of those type of things. Let me explain a little bit what I mean. I spoke about continuous integration and feature branching in a previous episode and got lots of comments. So in this episode is really focused on looking at what I think some of the misconceptions of feature branching really are based on some of those comments and based on other discussions that I've had with people over the years. I should begin by saying that of course it's possible to do development using feature branching. Of course you can even do a good job. My argument though is that if you want to do the best job rather than only a good job then I think you need continuous integration. The other aspect of feature branching is that when it does go wrong, the downsides are extremely severe. The HP LaserJet team used to spend five times as much effort on managing branches as they did writing new code before they adopted continuous delivery and with it continuous integration. My aim for this episode though is to look at this primarily from the perspective of change and managing change. Let's begin by imagining a single developer working alone. They need version control too. It allows them to step back to a secure position when they make a mistake. How they organise things though is entirely up to them. The simplest way is just to maintain a stream of changes that build upon one another. Trunk based development. After all, why would you feature branch if you were working alone? What does it give you that you don't already have with less typing? Developers working alone, though, still benefit from feedback that tells them that each of their changes works and that everything else works afterwards too. So continuous integration. Let's imagine now two developers. First, working independently of one another. If their code never touches the other person's code, never interacts in any way, then clearly there's no integration required ever except for integration within their own personal stream of changes as before. But it gets more interesting when their code is part of some bigger shared system. Here, each developer is making changes in parallel with the other. At each step, they add a change. So at each step, the total amount of change increases. It creates this kind of expanding code of change into the future. The longer the time period, the wider the cone. If you wait long enough, at some point the cones are going to intersect. That is, the changes will clash and at that point you may have a problem. Of course, you may not know it yet. Continuous integration works by limiting the time period and so limiting the fan out of the cone of changes. This reduces the risk of a clash. Of course, there are things that you can do in design that reduce the chances of one developer's code breaking another's. 
But if there is anything, anything at all that is shared between the two developers' work, then they are coupled to a greater or lesser degree. And so, at some point, their changes will interact. One developer's change may affect the other. You can only find out if my changes affect yours when you see them together. When they're integrated and not before. Let's just think for a moment in abstract terms about those changes. As time progresses, the quantity of change expands. Eventually, it's inevitable that the change in one place will overlap with the changes in another. A few people suggested in the comments to my previous video that if you have an idea of the course of the other people's work will take, then you can steer your work to avoid theirs. This is, of course, true, but also quite tricky to get right. It's also severely limited in terms of the size of the code base that you can work with in this way, because it relies on you understanding not just what you are doing, but also what everybody else is doing, and is what they're going to be doing too. Plus, this is stuff that's going to happen in the future. So this is a guess, and it's bound to be wrong at some point. We can limit the risk by changing how we organise our work. Instead of buying into this complexity, we simply shorten the time horizon during which changes can expand. Sure, our changes may still overlap, but the worst case is, if with a short time horizon, is that we're going to lo lose that time horizon's amount of work, a few minutes or at most a, a day's work perhaps. I once worked with a team that hadn't been able to even compile their whole system for over 18 months because of the branches of work had diverged so much. That project wasn't savable. So 18 months worth of work for every individual on the project, about 250 people on this project, was lost. This is expensive. Small time horizons matter a lot when trying to limit the risk of guesses about the future. The most common comment that I got to on my previous CI versus feature branching video was, I can regularly pull changes from trunk or origin master to my feature branch, so I'm continuously integrated. Well, I'm afraid that you are not. Let's look at that idea in a bit more detail. We have a team of three developers here each making changes on their own local feature branch. In this little animation, I am trying to visualize what each developer can see as they make progress and the current state at each stage of the release branch, whatever we decide to call that. Each developer is working on their own changes. To keep things simple, let's just assume that they pull a copy from Trunk every time they make a local change. What can they see? Initially, the developers are working blind. However many times they pull changes from trunk, all they see is what they already have because nobody's committed any changes yet. As obviously, as long as no one commits, no one sees changes from anyone else. Now, developer C pushes their finished feature. C's view of the changes are now accurate compared to trunk, they are in step, but still has no visibility at all of A and B's changes. C may have committed something that breaks A and B. No one knows that yet. A and B continue making changes. They pull C's changes, but now everyone has a different view of reality. C never even knew about A and B, B sees C's changes, but not A's. A sees C's changes, but not B's. Next, A pushes their finished feature. Now, you may have noticed that I haven't said anything about time scale here. This is always true, feature branching or continuous integration. Until you integrate your changes, you can't be sure that they will work. If you think that you can be sure, then I think that you're fooling yourself. It may be a risk that you can get away with, but there is never any guarantee that someone else's code won't break yours. So if this risk is always there, what can we do? 
Well, the interesting part is really this first period, where no one knows what anyone else is doing. As soon as someone commits something, we get a chance to see what's going on. We get greater visibility, even if we are only pulling changes from trunk to our own local copy. But until that point, you're working completely in the dark. So the best plan is to make the period when we are working in the dark as short as possible, and so the risks as low as possible. If you're working on a feature branch team, you should certainly pull changes regularly from trunk, just in case someone else pushes a change. But this works best when everyone else is pushing frequently, practicing continuous integration, even if you are not. And that's not a terribly team-centered approach, is it? Presumably, if you work on a team that practices feature branching, then you're all pushing roughly as often as each other. Uh, so you're all working in the blind to some extent during the period where nobody has yet got far enough with their features to be able to commit anything. Continuous integration is all about the shortness of the cycle. It's all about shortening that period when everyone else is in the dark. So okay, it's not really continuous, but that word is in the name for a reason. CI is about integrating as close to continuously as we can sensibly get. As I said in my previous video on this topic, continuous integration comes at a cost. It means that we need to adapt the way that we work to achieve it. I spoke last time about ideas like dark launching, branch by abstraction and feature toggles, but it's not some lunatic fringe idea. This is how many companies, many that you have heard of, some of the kinds of companies that you probably aspire to work in one day, organise their development. It not only works, but the data says that it works to produce measurably higher quality software more quickly than other approaches, including feature branching. As I said, this is the most contentious idea that I talk about. It causes emotional divisions between people. I'm trying as far as I can to make a less emotional argument here. This is not really about what I think or about what you think. It seems to me about something a bit more fundamental than that. It is an incontrovertible truth that if we have information in two or more places and that information is being modified in each place, then the longer the time, the more those copies will diverge from each other. That is not for debate, that is only fact. As the amount of divergence increases, then the amount of work to reconcile those copies, to bring them back into something coherent, increases too. Yes, we can alleviate the risk by informally imagining them merged together at some point in the future, which is what the plan to allocate work so that it doesn't clash does. But that too is down to our guesswork, our predictions of the future. And we're not good at making predictions like that with any great precision. So the only answer that deals in truth, in fact, rather than in our own guesswork, is to try and bring the different copies together more frequently, to work in smaller steps, and to integrate those steps more frequently. Without the continuous bit, we only have integration. Integration, continuous or not, comes at a cost. There is always the risk that we have made a change that can't be integrated. So ultimately, whenever you do work separate from others, you're taking the chance that your work won't merge. At that point, you may have to discard the work. So continuous integration reduces the risk of that happening by reducing the time scale of our work and so the amount of change that can happen prior to the merge. It also reduces the cost of failure, because if it does happen and you, only, and you can't merge your results, you only lost a small amount of work. My friend and co-author of our book, Continuous Delivery, has a take on why this idea is so contentious. Jez says that he thinks that it challenges some pretty fundamental ideas about how we think about software development. And I think he's probably right. 
Feature branching plays to the image, maybe even the self-image, of lone programmer, social introvert, heroically doing great things in the code base. As soon as we begin to write code with other people, though, this model really fails. Software development in teams is a social activity, like it or not. The best teams, based on what I've seen personally, but much more importantly than that, based on the data, are effectively, promiscuously, continuously collaborative. They make progress as a series of small, frequent steps. Continuous integration facilitates and reinforces that collaboration. I hope that this video may show you why that is the case. If you've got any thoughts on any of the stuff that I've talked about today, please do add them in the, co in the comments, particularly if you think that my reasoning is flawed in some way. Explain to me how I'm wrong. Thank you for watching.